Next, we will go over the directory structure of Linux, what it looks like, and how to navigate it. The directory structure in Linux is a little different than you used to from Windows. From Windows, you might be used to these drive letters. Uh, each drive is a different physical hard drive, and each one is denoted by a letter. That's not how it works in Linux. In Linux, it's all one big file tree. The top level of that file tree consists of a couple directories which are identical on every Linux system and in fact standardized and different physical hard drives are at different points in that tree, so-called mounting points. You can address every position in that file tree by what's called the path. That's basically where in the file system you are. Path looks like this generally. It's separated by forward slashes. Careful, it's forward slashes, not backslashes like in Windows. And each level in that tree is a subdirectory uh, and the lowest one is either a directory or a file. There are two types of paths. What you're seeing here is called an absolute path. In other words, it's in relation to the absolute top level of the file system tree. You can tell absolute paths because they always start with a forward slash. The alternative would be a relative path. A relative path does not start with a forward slash and it denotes a position relative to where you currently are, what's called your working directory. You can always tell where in the file tree you are by typing the command pwd, stands for print working directory, and that will show you the full path to the directory where you are. Here's what it looks like, pwd, and you can see this is the absolute path to my home directory in this case. Like I just said, the top level of the file tree is standardized. It's the same in every Linux, and it usually looks like this, sort of. So let's go over the individual directories that make up the top level of this tree. At the very top is what's called the root directory, and this is the absolute top level of the entire tree. Next, there's a directory that's called bin, and that contains binaries. Uh, for example, the programs that make up the actual shell that you use there's one that's called etc and that contains configuration files for many programs. The home directory is where you spend most of your time as your usual user. In the home directory, there's one subdirectory for every user. In that subdirectory are all the files that that user owns. It's usually also the only directory where that specific user can alter anything. All the other ones are protected and can only be accessed by admins. The opt directory contains optional programs, hence the name, and it's kind of similar to the C program files directory on Windows. The TMP directory contains temporary files. The USR directory contains what's called Unix system resources, uh, which is mostly just other programs and program libraries. The USR, interestingly, does not stand for user, and it doesn't contain any user-specific data. USR directory also contains a bunch of uh, subdirectories. What you're seeing here is just a part of the structure. There are multiple levels of subdirectories, but it's mostly binaries and libraries. And the var directory contains uh, files that vary over time, hence the name. Uh, the most prominent example of those are log files. There are a couple others that are not listed on that uh, tree. The DEV directory is one that you always see in at the top level of Linux that contains what's called device files. Device files aren't regular files. They are rather representation of the various hardware that's connected to the computer. For example, each hard drive has a device file in the dev directory. And if you want to address that hard drive, uh, you interact with that specific device file. The PROC directory contains various information about the Linux system itself. For example, there's a file there called proc slash CPU info. That's a text file which you can read like any other, and it contains information about the CPU in that case. What's important to keep in mind is that almost every command that you type on the command line is a program or a script somewhere in this tree. You can see where the actual program is with the which command. So if you type, for example, which hostname, which we've already used, 
you would see where that pro specific program that gets called when you call the hostname command where that uh, is stored. There are a couple shortcuts for specific directories. If you type the period or the dot, that's the current directory. If you type the dot dot two periods, that addresses the parent directory and the tilde sign is uh, always your home directory. The most important command to navigate that tree now is the cd command, it stands for change directory. It's a part of the POSIX standard, so it really is on every single Linux system. And the syntax is basically always the same. You type cd and then you type the path where you want to go to. That can be either an absolute path or it can be a relative path. You cannot go, strictly speaking, into every single directory as a normal user because uh, you might not have the permissions to do that. We'll go over permissions later on. It's also possible that you can execute something that's in a specific location, but you cannot read it. That's how the permissions are set up. And then there's these uh, three shortcuts that I showed on the previous slide. You can use those as shortcuts for a specific path. For example, what you're seeing here, cd dot dot, would move you one level up in the directory tree. One more thing to be on the lookout for, you can see up here between cd and dot dot, there's a space. That's because there's a cd command and the dot dot is an argument for that command. What you will very often see in Linux system is this one that basically does the same thing, but it's technically a different command. It's not part of the standard and not every Linux system might have it. So don't be surprised if you type in this and you get an error message. It happens rarely, but it happens. Here's what that looks like in practice. I can type CD and a path, in this case a relative path. I can even use tab completion on that path. And if I type enter, I go to that directory. And you can see I'm now in a different directory and I can type CD dot dot and go back up one level. In other words, into the directory where I was previously. The other one of the two most important commands that you need is called the ls command. The ls command stands for list and it lists what's in a directory. It's probably the single most commonly used Linux command. The Windows equivalent would be dil. It has a lot of options that allow you to specify how you want the output to be listed. In fact, there's one that's called ls-l that shows you more information and that's so common that it even has its own shortcut, it's called LL. Again, like the CD dot dot, you don't find that on every Linux system, but you find it very often. You can also show hidden files. A hidden file in Linux is one simply that starts with a dot and you can do that with the minus A option. There are also a bunch of other options, uh, minus T to sort by time modified is just one example. You have to look at the man page for all the options. Using it is pretty simple. You just type ls enter and you can see it now lists all the contents in my home directory. Let me go into the Linux demo again. Um, and I can even say ls, that uh, is again the, the context ls minus l would list a more detailed output. Uh, we will go over these individual options in the future, but you can see at least here that's the date last modified. And I can also specify a path as an argument for the ls command. For example, if I say ls slash home slash my username, it will once again list my home directory, even though I'm not actually in that home directory at the moment. But I can list every directory that I have access to that way. There are a couple more keyboard commands that you need to be aware of. The most important one is that copy paste isn't control C, control V, like you're probably used to. It's the middle mouse button. Basically, you highlight text, and when you press the middle mouse button, it pastes it. You've already seen that control C will stop a command, control Z will suspend it, and we'll see that in more detail later on. Control D will send an end of file. I won't go into the details of what that actually means but it's one way to quit a console. The most common way, however, is to just to type the exit command. And like I said before, shells within shells within shells. 
if you are in a subshell and you type exit, you are still in the shell that's one level above it. The most common case for clusters is that you are working in a shell on the cluster. If you type exit, you will lose the SSH connection to the cluster and you will be in a shell that's on your local computer. Finally, the clear command will clear the text that's on the screen. So you get, you get an empty console again.